Good evening, and welcome to tonight's John A. Widso Foundation Virtual Conversation, Church History and the World, Liberty Jail Letter. I'm Richard E. Turley, Jr., your host for this evening, and I want to welcome our two guests, Stephen S. Davis and David W. Grua, two scholars who, like most of our guests, are longtime friends of mine and well-known scholars in their fields. I will introduce them more fully in a moment. Before doing that, I want to mention next month's Church History and the World Conversation, which will focus on Doctrine and Covenants Section 132. That conversation will take place on Sunday, November 21st, and our guest for that evening will be Kathleen Flake, Richard Lyman Bushman, Professor of Mormon Studies in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. That should be a remarkable conversation, and we invite you to join us for that occasion. I also want to remind you that previous conversations in this series are available at the John A. Witzel Foundation website, www.witzelfoundation.org. Tonight's conversation will also be available at that site in about a week. Now this evening, I want to pay tribute to my father, Richard E. Turley Sr., who passed away this morning. He was a professor of engineering at the University of Utah, the first state science advisor for the state of Utah, executive director of the Utah Technology Finance Corporation, and late in his life, a general authority of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was not only my father and also my teacher and mentor, but a man whose life combined the intellect and faith in a way that's been a steady inspiration to me throughout my life. We love you, Dad, and we'll miss you. With that, let's turn to tonight's conversation. We'd like to remind you of the format for these events. We will begin this evening with a discussion between our guests and me. I will pose questions to them to initiate the conversation and move it along. Meanwhile, we invite you as audience members to craft your own questions, which we'll begin addressing about half or two thirds of the way through the hour. You should be able to submit your questions to us on whatever program you're using to view or listen to this event this evening. Now let me introduce you to our guests for this evening. Stephen S. Davis is a lifelong Missourian and an attorney specializing in federal Fifth Amendment, Fifth Amendment takings law and election litigation in trial and appellate courts. Prior to entering private law practice, Steve served as an assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of Missouri. Earlier in his career, he was elected as the chief clerk and administrator of the Missouri House of Representatives. In his spare time, if there is such a thing, Steve loves to research and write about the legal history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, especially in its Missouri period. He and his wife and four children live in St. Louis. David W. Grua is a historian and documentary editor with the Joseph Smith Papers. He holds a PhD in American history from Texas Christian University, as well as degrees in history from Brigham Young University. He was a co-editor for Documents Volume 6, the Joseph Smith Papers volume that covers Joseph Smith's experiences in the Clay County Jail in Liberty, Missouri during the winter of 1838 and 1839. David edited the Prophet's correspondence featured in the volumes. He also oversees the Joseph Smith Papers digital publication of more than 200 legal cases involving Joseph Smith as a party, witness, or judge. David is the author of Joseph Smith's Missouri Prison Letters and the Mormon Textual Community, a chapter in the edited collection titled Foundational Texts of Mormonism, which was published just uh, prior, David notes, to President Russell M. Nelson's issuing guidance on using the official name of the church in 2018. David served his Latter-day Saint mission in downtown Los Angeles, California, Spanish speaking from 1998 to 2000. He married Hope Hendrickson, and they currently live in Grantsville, Utah, with their three children. Welcome, Steve and David. Thank you. Honored to David, be with you. David, it's good to be here. David. Thank you. I'm going to direct questions to you individually, and either of you should feel free to chip in at any time to add your comments to what the other has to say. So let's start with David. David, why was Joseph Smith in the Clay County Jail in Liberty, Missouri? So he he was arrested around almost at the end of October in 1838 at the conclusion of 
what has been known as the Mormon War. Uh, this was a, a conflict between the Latter-day Saints and their neighbors in northern, northern Missouri um, that ha had several causes, but um, one of the main causes is that the state of Missouri had established the it's Caldwell County, where Far West was, in 1836, and there was an implicit understanding that Latter-day Saints would remain in the county. The idea was this would be a fix, a solution to to solve the earlier um, violence between the saints and, and their, their enemies in the state. Uh, but Joseph Smith, he arrived in, in Far West in early 1838, um, and he was probably not aware of any understanding that the saints would stay in, in Far West. And so he, he was told by the Lord to, to establish stakes in the areas round about. And so that's when Adam on Diamond was established, a little community known as DeWitt um, was also established. And these outlying settlements were targeted by the church's enemies um, and people, militia started gathering and uh, targeted them and eventually started expelling them from those areas. This led to an armed conflict um, with with buildings being burned on both sides. Um, and, and so that's when Lilburn W. Boggs, who had previously declined to intervene in, in the crisis, he called out the militia and ordered the arrest of Joseph Smith. Um, so, it was, you know, so it was at the end of October of 1838 that he was arrested um, and eventually charged with, with multiple crimes, including treason. Um, and Stephen can can jump in and tell us a bit more about that. Tell us about that, Stephen. I mean, why didn't Joseph just post bail and wait for his trial? Right. So uh, as uh, David mentioned, uh, Halloween, October 31st, um, 1838, uh, Joseph and the other leaders of the church are arrested. They're given over to uh, the state militia by uh, Colonel Hinkle, who I believe Joseph would later call uh, Judas Iscariot Hinkle, I don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but uh, turned over to the state and arrested. And uh, uh, of course, we all know about this, the death sentence, the court martial uh, death sentence pronounced upon them, saved by the courageous act of Alexander Donovan, a great friend of the church and Joseph's lawyer. Um, and uh, because after Donovan saved his life, they were imprisoned. Uh, taken to Independence and then um, uh, to Richmond and then finally to Clay County. Uh, they're, in, uh, they're charged with treason. Uh, Joseph is charged with treason. And uh, uh, scholars like David, like uh, uh, Gordon Madsen, legal scholars have looked at this and analyzed Missouri law at the time. And they, f they figured out that probably the reason that why, why Joseph was charged with treason is because treason, uh, you could not post bail uh, and be released from prison before trial if you're charged with either treason or murder. Now, I don't think they could, even they couldn't find a way to charge Joseph with murder. He was nowhere near the Battle of Crooked River or other incidents where uh, people were killed. Um, so they went with treason. And I've uh, there's uh, it's a big it's treason against the state of Missouri. And there's, a, there's been a legal debate about whether you can commit treason against a particular state rather than the United States. But that was the charge and, and that was done so that they could keep Joseph, Hiram, and the other uh, leaders of the church in prison and, and hold them as hosti hostages, Gordon Mad Madsen has said, until they could force the rest of the church out of the state. And once, uh, once the, the, the main body of saints was gone out of the state, then uh, we see that uh, the prisoners were allowed to escape. Just a follow-up question, uh, Stephen. In the violence that occurred between Latter-day Saints and their neighbors, I, I believe David would confirm that, that uh, far more Latter-day Saints died than, than any other group of people. Were any Missourians charged for those crimes? No, not at all. And that was a complaint made by Joseph 
and others in their legal proceedings that this was completely one-sided, called it an ex parte uh, hearing or trial against the saints. And no Missourians were charged with any crime that we know of. And I will note that that technique of holding Joseph in jail on a questionable charge of treason was later used in Illinois to hold him in the Carthage jail so he could be uh, killed by a mob. Uh, Stephen, I mean, that worked. <laughs> yes, it worked in their case. Um, David, uh, you've spent a lot of time looking at Joseph's correspondence for this time period and other documents. Uh, you've visited Liberty Jail in, in yes. your life now. Mm -hmm. What were the conditions like in Liberty Jail at the time for Joseph and his fellow prisoners? So terrible in, in a word. Um, you know, the Clay County Jail, it was the county jail, and it, it was a two-story building. The only way to get in in or out of the building was to go up a, a flight of stairs. The stairs led to double double doors, thick iron studded doors. Um, and you had to open one and then another to get into the upper level. Um, and then in the middle of the, of the upper level was a trap door that went down into the dungeon, what was referred to as the dungeon. Uh, this was a 14 by 14 space that had two narrow slits, only, only about a few inches high, um, that those, those were the only sources of natural light in, in the basement, the dungeon area. Um, the ceiling was probably six and a half feet. We don't know for sure, but it was about six and a half feet. So there's a common misconception that Joseph and the others had to stoop while they were down there. Chances are they, they were able to stand up. The only exception is Alexander McRae, who was 6'7". But even he in his later accounts never described um, having to stoop while he was in the, in the dungeon. But the, the walls were four foot, four foot thick, including heavy timbers as well as stones, rocks. So even though they, they would try to, to find ways to escape, it was, it was very well fortified. Um, they described terrible, terrible food that was given to them. Uh, they had just, they described dirty straw mattresses that they, that they slept on. Um, they described being taunted by people walking by in the street. They could come up and yell into these little narrow windows. Um, they, they also, they just, you know, the conditions were terrible, but there was all, there also had some privileges. They were allowed to go up to the to the upper level and receive and have meals. They were able to people were able to visit them. So Emma Emma Smith visited the Prophet Joseph three times during his time in the jail. Um, he was they were allowed to walk around the town with some supervision. Um, and we have an account from an attorney who described Joseph and his fellow prisoners visiting him in the in in liberty and borrowing books um, so they had some some you know privileges um, but the most important thing probably for us today is that they were able to write letters they were able to communicate with the saints outside of the jail and those letters give us a sense of what life was like in in the dungeon area thank you very much i've i spent my own time there in Liberty Jail over the years. And as someone who spent many of his elementary school days in the Midwest and visited Missouri many times because my mother's from Southwestern Missouri, I will tell you that as one who used to deliver newspapers in the cold winters of the Midwest, the thing that struck me most about the jail was those narrow window slits without window glass on them, just bars. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at that as, as a young man and thought the thing that would have gotten me the most is that Missouri cold. Uh, Steve, you're one who oh. understands the Missouri cold. Tell us what they would have felt like. I, I uh, can't tell you uh, enough. I can't convey how uh, cold, bitterly cold uh, it gets here. Uh, the winters are horrible. The summers are horrible. There's a little space in between each of those. Uh, that's very nice. Um, but uh, uh, I hope that winter would have been better than summer, although being in the dungeon of the jail, maybe uh, in the basement, you would have some relief from the heat, but extreme, I can't imagine the extreme cold uh, that they would have experienced with those, with those windows. Uh, we know that they were, 
I, I grew up visiting Liberty Jail. I've, I've gone this year. I've gone many, many times. Uh, it, it's, it, it's so impressive the way it was built with huge stones, as David mentioned, and then a layer of loose stone and then uh, thick timbers, uh, timbers a foot long, a uh, foot uh, 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 wide. Um, but they, the prisoners, they were very industrious. And we learned from the letter that uh, they were able to uh, bore through the timbers and the stone. And we, they only had, you know, the outside stone left and they would have been free. But they, uh, due to the um, misapprehension of a friend outside, uh, they were discovered. And then after that, apparently they were not allowed by the jailer to meet with people alone or, or speak with people alone for fear that... Uh, people would bring in things to the prisoners or uh, discuss plans to escape again. But, but, but I, I, I like how David described it, that they, um, it's not quite like jail today. They did have some privileges. They were, uh, they had the upstairs room that people could have stayed in visiting them. Uh, Alex Baugh has done some interesting research about Joseph Smith's dog, Old Major, who he mentions in one of his letters um, uh, that old major apparently was allowed to stay with Joseph in the jail for a time. So they did have some uh, comforts, but overall I, I view Liberty Jail, especially in the winter as a terrible place. It's often described in the church and I think uh, well done that uh, Liberty Jail was a temple prison meaning that wonderful uh, revelations were received there and the spirit of God spoke to Joseph and the others there, uh, but it was a terrible prison. In, in a letter to Emma, uh, Joseph would say, uh, we're about to be released from this jail to go on to D Davies County. And I don't know what's gonna happen to us, but we can't be in a worse hole than this one. And I just, I just can't imagine how terrible it was um, to be there for, I think they were there for about four months out of their five months of, of total imprisonment. And ju just a, a horrible place to be. I would, I, I think of it as a terribly sanctifying jail or, or prison that they were in. Thank you. David, you mentioned that one of the privileges they had was writing letters. You spent a lot of your professional career studying those letters. What kind of letters did Joseph write in the jail? Well, so I kind of separate them into two groups. You had the letters that he wrote to Emma, and then he had letters that he wrote to the church. And the letters that he wrote to Emma, there are five that have survived, and, and then one letter that she wrote to him that has survived. These are, these are interesting because Joseph, even from a young age, didn't like to write himself. He almost, by the time, when he was old enough to uh, to start composing things, he, he relied on scribes. But the one exception that he made was for Emma. He would write letters to her in his own hand. Uh, and we even have a reference to him saying that he felt as though it was his husbandly duty to write to her in his own hand. Um, this was seen as a way of sending part of yourself to someone, to someone else. So we have five letters that Joseph wrote to Emma in his own hand. They, these are precious specimens where he's focused on her welfare, the welfare of their children and the saints at large. Uh, these were letters that she cherished and kept throughout her life. Um, and it's through her keeping them that they eventually made their way into the Community of Christ archives, the RLDS church archives, and as well as other Midwest archives. Um, a couple of them have, have made their way to Salt Lake City and to the church's archives. Uh, and then he also, when he wrote to the church, that's when he relied on his fellow prisoners to act as, he didn't have many options, um, but he had those who were with him in the dungeon um, who were willing to take dictation from him. Um, Alexander McCray served as one of his scribes, as well as Caleb Baldwin for part of it. And these were men who had maybe even less education than Joseph did. So the spelling, if you, if you get on to the Joseph Smith Papers website, you can read the letters that Joseph dictated to the church. And the spelling isn't great, but we even have hand, Joseph's handwriting on these letters where he tried to go through and proofread 
And he corrected a few things. Uh, there's still a lot that today, with from our point of view, we we look at and wonder about the the spelling. But um, so he wrote these 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 letters, and he you can tell that he's got in mind he wants to write letters that will comfort the saints, reassure them. They've just gone through; they're still experiencing a terrible ordeal. Um, and he is wanting to help them. He knows that people are wondering about their testimonies. They've just been told by the governor of Missouri that they had to leave. Um, we have some evidence that there were plenty of people who decided that they were giving up being members of the church so that they could stay in Missouri. Um, so he knew that there were people that needed reassurance. They didn't know what, what to expect in the future with their prophet in jail. And so these letters served as, as means of reassuring the church that, that the Lord was still in charge and that he was going to continue guiding them even during this very dark period in their history. Um, and so that's what these letters provide for us even today. Uh, you know, light shining in very, a very dark period of the Prophet Joseph's life. And if Thank I could you. just add to that, um, so David described letters to Emma and letters to the church, and what is so wonderful about this letter we're talking about tonight is that it was addressed to the church at large and to Bishop Partridge, but also to Emma, and Joseph directed that Emma should be the first one to read the letter, and Thank I you. think that is beautiful. Um, that, that he would uh, uh, give that uh, direction. Uh, he yeah. thought constantly, of course, of his family. I think of, I, he was, a, he was a, I think, a 32-year-old young father at the time, and how terribly ex excruciating this must have been for him and all of the saints. Steve, you mentioned how terrible it would have been to be there. You referred to what a horrible place it was, this uh, Temple Prison, I think that term was popularized by one of my predecessors as Assistant Church Historian B.H. Roberts. Uh, how did they end up in that location of all places they could have been? So they, um, the, uh, the state charged Joseph and others with treason, of course, and, and a whole bunch of other saints with other uh, crimes, uh, robbery, larceny, um, murder, uh, uh, all kinds of crimes. Uh, they these crimes were alleged to have been uh, committed in either Caldwell or Davies counties. Now, those are the, the new counties created with the help of Alexander Donovan, our lawyer and friend in the legislature, who got those counties created, got Caldwell County created just for the saints, kind of like a, a, an Indian reservation for Mormons in Missouri. And, uh, you know, no one knows that today, just as an aside, that uh, when I speak to, to, to groups, to, to high schoolers, I, you know, I'm, I'm so, I, I'm a little shocked that no one knows the history of Missouri, that we had a county created just for one type of people. And so the Caldwell County was created as a type of reservation for the saints. Davies County was also created. Um, and we settled in both places, and the uh, the the uh, 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 the the fighting uh, that happened that David described earlier happened uh, mostly in in uh, Davies County uh, in that time span in October of 1838, and so uh, that's where uh, they were charged. But to make a long answer. Uh, shorter and to the point, there was no jail in either Caldwell County or Davies County. Uh, so the closest jail uh, was either Richmond in Richmond in Ray County, which is where all of the prisoners ended up for a short time for the month of well for the month of November, and then Joseph and Hiram and the other smaller group were taken to. Uh, uh, the Clay County Jail. We call it the Liberty Jail, refer it to the, as the Liberty Jail, but it was the Clay County Jail. Uh, Liberty was the, the county seat of Clay County. And so we had saints both in Richmond and in Liberty. And then um, we would have Parley Group Pratt and a small group of other saints end up in Boone County in the jail there. Thank you. So David, one 
reason that we're talking about these letters tonight is that three sections of our Doctrine of Covenants come from that correspondence that Joseph wrote from Liberty Jail. Can you tell us how that came about? Yeah, so there are three, three we, we often refer to the Liberty Jail letter, um, but there are actually three what we call general epistles written to the saints at large. Um, one of them was written in December of 1838, and then there were two that were written close together in March of 1839. Um, and Joseph, so let's see, Emma and many of church members started leaving Missouri in February of 1839. So it's been a few weeks. Joseph and those in the prison haven't heard anything from their families. Uh, and then on March 20, March 19th was when um, messengers came with letters from Emma and, and the, the other wives of the prisoners. And Joseph described in the March 20th letter how he had been feeling frustrated, anxious, upset, and that it was receiving these letters that melted his heart and opened his heart to, to receive revelation. Um, he describes how, you know, the, it was, the condition of his heart was such that the spirit could come and whisper to him, my son, peace be unto thy soul. So that, that famous part. Um, so the letters, actually, the, these two March letters, they start out with a greeting from all of the prisoners together. So all the, there, there are five, I think five prisoners at this point, and they're speaking in a, in a unified voice. We know from another letter that Joseph was actually dictating, but he was dictating in the voice of the prisoners speaking together. Um, and it's, he's providing information and then he shifts and talks and he includes his prayer, which opens DNC 121, where he's pleading with the Lord to, to, to hear, to hear them and to be with his suffering people. Then he shifts again back into the, uh, description of what's going on with their lawyers, um, and then he describes the reception of the letters from Emma and others. And then, then we get the section that deals with um, where the Lord is answering Joseph's prayer. So the, so the way that Joseph dictated the letters, it was going in and out of the prisoners talking, then Joseph praying, then the prisoners talking again, and then the Lord speaking. Um, and so there are, there are large sections of, of these letters that in the 1870s, when, when Orson Pratt, the church historian, um, he had received a, a commission from Brigham Young to prepare a new edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, and he wanted to include sections or portions of these letters. So Orson Pratt went through and found the best parts, I guess you could say, and excised them from the larger context of the letters. Um, in, and he took parts of the March 20th letter and then parts of what we, how we date um, in the Joseph Smith papers, the circa 22 letter and combined them in DNC 121. And then section 122 comes from the circa 22 letter as well as the as section 123. Um, so it's, it's, it's really a, an interesting experience to go back and read the entire letters, um, Jack Welch, who you know has been very prominent in the in the Witso Foundation, as well as Dean Jesse, they published in BYU Studies several years ago transcripts of the letters, and then put in bold the parts that were taken and put into the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, so that that's available online, and I don't know if there's a way we can put a link to that in the show notes or something. Um, so that people can go and find that. But I encourage everyone to go and to see the parts of the, you know, the, the, sec the, the portions that became Doctrine and Covenants 121 to 123, read those in the context of the, of the two letters uh, that were written in March. Looks like Steve's got it there. Yeah, I, that's what I printed out to prepare for this. That's an excellent article. So, um, you know, a lot of people don't, of course, uh, realize that 
these sections were taken from this two-part letter and that there are many portions that were not included in scripture. It was a, a very long letter and uh, the best parts were put in scripture. There are some wonderfully inspiring other parts of the letter. And the one of the easiest ways is to look up that BYU Studies article from 2000 that uh, David mentioned. But if I could put a plug in for and uh, sing David's praises, the Joseph Smith Papers is just the most incredible resource that I have ever seen and puts lays it all out uh, for the reader. Uh, you can... I. You can open a volume about Liberty Jail, and it gives you historical context. It gives you the entire letter with footnotes and an analysis of who, whose handwriting is what. And they've just been so meticulous in everything they've done in the Joseph Smith Papers. And you don't even have to buy the books. You can; it's all online with the great, great images of the documents themselves and explanations. And I, I just marvel at all the work that has gone into the Joseph Smith papers and how wonderful uh, uh, everything is. I echo that, Stephen. Uh, and I'm going to ask both of you about giving us more detail on the contents of the letters from which the revelations were extracted. Uh, let's begin with Steve. Steve, I want you to talk about why the prophet might have focused so much in the in the portion that's published about priesthood leaders and how they should function. And then, David, I'm going to ask you after he finishes to just talk about some of the nuggets in the non-canonized portions. So let's start with Steve. Right. So we we read in section 121, uh, Joseph talks extensively about. Uh, you know, the, the famous uh, scriptures we read, no power influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness and by love and faith, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile. Um, I, I think that he's discussing this at length because of the horrible conditions that they are going through at this point were brought about by, in some large part at least, by uh, priesthood leaders of the church who had um, unfortunately, I think, become uh, prideful and had uh, exercised uh, their authority um, beyond what they should have. Um, the Missouri presidency, uh, 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 David Whitmer, W.W. Phelps, John Whitmer, um, they ran into some trouble with um, uh, helping the saints recuperate after being, uh, 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 after the expulsion from Jackson County and the selling of land in Caldwell County and Far West. And, and so, um, and, and then you end up with, um, uh, in June of 1838 with the SALT sermon and some negative feelings expressed toward uh, who we refer to as dissenters in the church uh, who were themselves um, kicked out of far west by other members of the church. Um, uh, I think it was heavily on the mind of the prophet that uh, uh, this should, this kind of uh, uh, leading uh, by this kind of authority should not be done. And instead, uh, we should uh, uh, be gentle and mild and, um, and not overbearing and not a law unto ourselves. I think the phrase that's been extracted uh, for the Doctrine and Covenants, we have learned by sad experience, echoes what you're saying there. Exactly, exactly. That, uh, and, and, and it ended with uh, former church leaders like, um, like Thomas B. Marsh and Orson Hyde, W.W. Uh, Phelps, going to the Missourians and Missouri authorities and um, swearing out affidavits that were hurtful and caused uh, the, uh, the Missouri authorities, Governor Boggs, to overreact uh, to what had, hap what had actually happened in Caldwell and Davies County. And, and that led to uh, the worst of all possible things, an extermination order against an entire group of people. 
And fascinatingly, the three that you mentioned, Thomas Marsh returns to the church, I think in 1857. And of course, Orson Hyde returns and is reinstated into the Quorum of the Twelve. And William W. Phelps returns and ultimately writes the memorial hymn for the prophet upon his death. And Oliver Cowdery returned. Oliver Cowdery returned. So it's, you know, some of the Whitmers and others did not, but I, I think it's, uh, it goes to your point about how we deal with conflict, how we deal with, with tensions. David, uh, what are some of the nuggets that are not canonized? Okay. Um, so I wanted to share, a, this is a quote from a, a letter that he wrote to an, a regular member of the church, Prescindia Buell. Um, this was just the week before he wrote the letter to the, to the church at large. And you can tell that some of the themes that appeared in the larger letter um, were on his mind. He's thinking about the meaning of suffering. He's thinking about what is the ultimate outcome um, of suffering. And what I find interesting is that he's connecting revelation and new knowledge to suffering. So he told Prescindia, he said, he said that his heart bleeds continually as he contemplated the distress of the church. He wanted to be reunited with the saints, and he stated, quote, that he would not shrink, shrink at toil and hardship to render them comfort and consolation. He wanted the blessing once more to lift up his voice in the midst of the saints so he could pour out his soul to God for their instruction and more fully share with them the plan that God had revealed for the church. He actually says, I haven't had the chance to share the plan that the Lord has given me with the, with the saints. Here he is in 1839, and he feels as though he hasn't had that opportunity. But he says that um, the saints' troubles will only give us that knowledge to understand the minds of the ancients. Uh, for my part, he says, I think I could never have felt as I do now if I had not suffered the wrongs that I have suffered. Okay. Um, and then, you know, five days later, he, he uh, dictated the large March 20th letter. And I just want to share just a personal experience with this. One of the things that we have the opportunity of doing on the Joseph Smith papers is that the, the historians who work on it, it's one of, part of our job is to look at the original manuscripts and to make sure that the transcripts that, that the project has prepared are accurate. And so I have this, this memory that is seared into my mind of sitting at my desk at the church history library and I have the March 20 letter on my desk. And I, I've got the transcript printed out on one side and I've got the original letter. And I keep thinking, Joseph Smith held this, this letter. Um, and I got to this portion, which is not in, in the Doctrine and Covenants. And I had this profound experience where the spirit witnessed to me that Joseph Smith was a prophet. This is what he said. It is by him, meaning the Lord, that we received our birth. It was by his voice that we were called to a dispensation of his gospel in the beginning of the fullness of times. And it was by him that we received the Book of Mormon. He said, hell may pour forth its rage like the burning lava of Mount Vesuvius or of Etna or of the most terrible of the burning mountains. And yet Mormonism shall stand. And I, as I was reading back and forth and checking the transcript, I found myself reading aloud. The words were so powerful on, on me that I was reading aloud and I'm thinking I'm alone in my office here. No one can hear me. Um, but it was a profound witness to me um, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. Um, another in that, well, in that same section of the letter, uh, Joseph references Governor Boggs and his murder, murderous crew. Uh, that they would not hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. Um, and then finally, so in Doctrine and Covenants 121, verse 26, so Orson Pratt included part of 
part of this sentence, but he ended up cutting off the first part. So the, the canonized verse says that God shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit that has not been revealed since the world um, until now. Uh, but at the beginning of the sentence, Joseph initially wrote, after your tribulations, God shall give you knowledge. So we, we missed that initial part about how it's after they pass through the tribulations that God would give, give them knowledge. Um, and we see this in the letter that Joseph is hinting at these new profound truths um, about a council in heaven, um, about a, you know, the, 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 you know, heavenly father and, and the council meeting together. Uh, and he says, you know, maybe no one has known this from the foundations of the world. Um, these are the types of things that Joseph is learning about that he is anxious to share with the saints, that once he's able to get to Nauvoo, he can share in more, in more detail with them. So those are some of the nuggets that, that we get from, from reading the whole letter and understanding the context. Steve, we've got to get on to the questions from our audience, but just very quickly, what's... Yeah, and, that, and I, I, it's such a, that's such an amazing uh, story that David uh, mentioned. Um, but in that same section of the letter, God says, God hath said, or Joseph says, God hath said he would have a tried people. And then he talks about Abraham and the sacrifice of Abraham. And he says, we're going through the same thing now. And if we want the blessings, uh, we have to go through this trial and, and then he says this, and I had to double check this uh, sentence that it, I thought it was in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's so marvelous, but he's, he's, he, he's contemplative and he says, thy mind, O man, if thou wilt lead a soul unto salvation, must stretch as high as the utmost heavens and search into and contemplate the lowest considerations of the darkest abyss and expand upon the broad considerations of eternal expanse. He must commune with God. So uh, I, I think he was in the darkest abyss and thinking about uh, the expanse of heaven and received that revelation. Thank you very much. One of our uh, questioners points out something in a letter that uh, he particularly likes and asks this question, which I'd like to direct to David. Uh, is it possible to add to the canon by including some of what's not in the Doctrine and Covenants today? I think, uh, Rick, you're probably in a better position to to talk about what can what can or can't be um, added to the canon. Um, that you know that's way above my pay grade. Um, but Rick actually knows the people who are at that pay grade. I, I will just say in, in simple terms that there is a scriptures committee of the church that considers questions like that, and from time to time, over the over the decades, additions have been made. So that's above all of our pay grades, but it's something that is uh, conceivably possible. But uh, it's it's not something that the three of us can decide here. Uh, another question for you, David, as a historian: How did how did these letters get distributed to people? I mean, how did they hear what was in them? Yeah, that's a great that that's really interesting. You know, Joseph wrote. When he sent the, the March 20th letter to, to Illinois, he wrote, he, he wrote a letter to Emma on March 21st. And he said, I want you to read it first. And then I want my parents to read it and then hand it to the brethren. But I also want you to copy it. So Joseph gave instructions to Latter-day Saints to copy. Um, and he ended up with the, with the March 22nd letter we, we actually have two drafts and it appears that Joseph sent both drafts. There were only minor differences, but we have Joseph's handwriting on the second draft, um, or sorry, rather on the first draft and then there, his changes were incorporated into the second. But it, it was through these copies that they were able to circulate the, the, the letters more broadly. Um, we have uh, Mary Fielding Smith, Hiram's wife, she wrote a letter to Hiram uh, and said, we have read the letters that you sent multiple times and, and they are like food for the hungry. Um, so she, let's see, 
They seem like food for the hungry. We have taken great pleasure on perusing them. And we have copies in the handwriting of Edward Partridge, so we know he made his own copies. Um, Albert Perry Rockwood, uh, a member of the church, made his own copies and sent them to relatives in Massachusetts. And those letters ended up in the archives of Yale University. Those copies ended up at Yale University. So we know that people were making copies, they were quoting them in letters and sending them to their relatives. So that's how they got distributed. Eventually, they, they published them in the, the Times and Seasons and then in the Deseret News in Utah. Um, but initially, it was through copies that, that they were distributed. Thank you for that answer. This next question from a viewer goes to you, Steve, because it deals with the legal issue. And normally, I don't mention the names of the people asking the questions. But in this case, it happens to be Mark Ashurst McGee, one of our colleagues in the Joseph Smith papers. And he, he writes this, whether or not Joseph Smith's imprisonment was a mere hostage tactic, what was or apparently was or would have been the case for treason? Thanks to Mark for that question. Very good uh, question. So I've been studying the treason indictments against uh, Joseph and the others. And the case for treason is very weak. Can I say that? Um, that, uh, th that there was a meeting held in Davies County where Joseph Smith uh, told uh, the, uh, the saints gathered there that the, the time was past uh, for us to depend upon the civil authorities that we're going to establish the kingdom of God that Daniel spoke of by force, and we're going to do it ourselves. So there was some con conspiratorial uh, uh, words spoken by Joseph. Uh, and then um, uh, that uh, uh, the actions of violence, uh, the burning of the uh, stores in uh, Gallatin and the homes there uh, were acts of violence. Uh, but interestingly, uh, dates for those occurrences, which must be specified uh, with peculiarity uh, in, a in a treason indictment or any indictment, there were blanks left for all the dates and uh, no uh, overt act of treason. Uh, they, they took a form uh, indictment form uh, that David discovered in an old uh, 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 English law book, and they just copied it and left blanks for uh, the actual acts, overt acts of treason to be committed. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking into that. It's very interesting, but uh, there's, there's, uh, Joseph never said he intended to overthrow the state of Missouri, and uh, that's basically what you would have uh, to be indicted or convicted of, of treason. Thank you. David, this next question is for you on the conditions within the jail. Mm -hmm. This audience uh, member writes about a very practical matter. What kind of latrines did the Liberty Jail have? How did, they, In other words, how did they deal with the basic biological needs on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, well, other than letting the prisoners out, um, my understanding is that they would let a bucket down um, and let them use that. And I think that there were some, there are some accounts that sometimes the, the same bucket was used to, to lower food down to them. Um, so that's probably more detail than most of the audience want, but. Not, not particularly uh, appetizing. No. Okay. Um, next question. How did the Liberty Jail experience change the Prophet Joseph Smith's outlook and the way he viewed humanity going forward to the Nauvoo period? And I'll, I'll uh, start with Stephen and uh, David, feel free to chip in as well. Uh, you know, I can't even comprehend uh, what the Liberty Jail experience uh, was to the Prophet. The, if you read this amazing letter uh, long and detailed letter from beginning to end with all the context that doesn't appear in our scriptures. I think it, it's, it takes you on an emotional roller coaster with the prophet, where at the beginning he's um, reciting the wrongs that have been done and, and asking and pleading uh, God for vengeance against their enemy. And then um, 
he goes through and talks about the kindness of the saints and receiving those letters. And, and then uh, he talks, he talks again about um, charity and let thy bowels be uh, filled with compassion and let vir virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. And so um, uh, it takes, uh, I think a very harsh, horrible experience just deepened his soul and made him be able to contemplate um, the, the utmost heavens and the darkest abyss. And that, you know, we see in Nauvoo, uh, what I see in Nauvoo from the prophet is uh, a, a, a real confidence and a surety that he was the Lord's prophet and that he was going to accomplish this work. David, as you're answering the question as well, I want to add this additional question, which is related, because I think you might be, might want to respond to both of them simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Did Joseph follow this insight as he moved into Nauvoo? Quote, pure friendship always becomes weakened the very moment you undertake to make it stronger by penal oaths and secrecy, close quote. Uh, so I guess the first question of... Um, you know how did how did he how did the jail experience change his view of humanity? Um, Steve hit on some really the good the you know the great passages in in the letters that that talk about him turning more towards um, mercy, compassion, uh, what we would call you know from that letter righteous dominion, uh, the exercise of power in a righteous way. Um, he also he became very anxious about wanting to share uh, the principles of the restored gospel um, when he left the jail. And he, you know, he, he, he had the sense that he may not have a lot of time left. And, um, and so he came out of the jail with a new sense of urgency. And it's at that point that later that summer that he starts sharing and teaching some of the profound principles associated with the temple um, that that he had been learning over the previous decade, but now he's starting to to teach it in more detail to to those who um, that he's associating with. Um, yeah, so you know, Rick, maybe you can weigh in on the the question of the the oaths and. Um, you know, I think he's referring back to the Danite oaths um, and saying, you know, maybe setting up a, a, an independent militia and binding people by oath is not a great idea. Um, he does caution against that in the letter, you know, yeah. in the non-canonical parts of the letter. He says, mm -hmm. let our counsels be more mild. Uh, and I, we counsel against this kind of activity in the future. Yeah. I, I agree. I think that's what he was referring to. And I also think that that, that phrase, we have learned by sad experience, includes that, that very thing that you're talking about there. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. We got one more question. Then I'm going to ask a couple of you some wrap up questions. This writer says, I read somewhere that David McKay called the revelation in these letters something like the greatest revelation known to man. Have you heard or read that? And what perspective could you give to that? Have other prophets said anything like that? Either of you heard that? I have not heard that. Of course, you you have section seventy six that comes to mind as one of the great revelations, but this is this letter is just amazing and and stands in my mind with the the epistles of Paul. Hmm. Any other comments, David? Oh, just that the brethren have returned to these sections in the Doctrine and Covenants repeatedly throughout the years, even in my own lifetime. It seems like every few years. Uh, the brethren devoted a new talk to to aspects of the letters and to the revelations. So it's it's something that you know I find as a scholar I can study these letters and find endless meaning. But also in devotional settings, um, our church leaders have continually drawn from them to teach the saints today. That was exemplified in just this past conference with mm -hmm. Elder Cook's wonderful mm -hmm. address about Liberty Jail. Uh, where he's, he said that, uh, in truth, we learn that uh, adversity and trials are not, uh, 
they're they're not because of unrighteousness that, that the prophet went through trials that that the lord had in mind for him to to strengthen him and and the church thank you and now a question we always like to ask in this uh, set of conversations because the johnny Witso foundation likes to focus on the global church the circumstances that led to these letters from which uh, we extract three sections of the Doctrine and Covenants occurred in a very specific American political uh, context in the state of Missouri. So let me ask you both this question. Why are these letters, and particularly the portions that have been canonized, important to people around the globe? Either one of you want to start off on that one? Well, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, you know, the, the experience in these letters relates to people everywhere. And I can, um, uh, I'm always called back to my personal uh, testimony and witness of the prophet Joseph Smith. I was a young and ignorant missionary in Tokyo, Japan. And I was newly on, on my mission just a, a couple weeks out and not able to speak the language as I uh, would have liked to have been able to at the time and so my job with my companion in teaching the joseph smith story was to hold up the picture of the first vision that was my job and i'll and then to bear a, a short testimony after my companion talked about uh, the prophet joseph and i can tell you that uh, it, it was deeply impressed on my soul as i bore testimony to uh, p uh people in Japan on the other side of the world where I was from, and on the other side, a side of uh, the world from Missouri where these events took place, and to feel um, uh, them receive a witness of the truthfulness of the message that we were te uh, teaching and the, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and his testimony of the Savior in the Book of Mormon. And I just al will always remember that moment and the feelings that I felt and these truths apply across the world, uh, wherever uh, you may be. David? Yeah, and I, I, you know, I can just reiterate that, that in my experience as a Spanish-speaking missionary in, in downtown Los Angeles, um, I, I have memories of, of reading these sections in Spanish and, and finding them to be the ones that the members of the church that they came back to. Um, I think that there's just something about pain and suffering and crying out to God and having him answer that is relatable across cultures um, and across languages and that people identify with that and feel the power of, of, these, of these sections because of that. And the answer is not easy. It's not a quick fix. Mm -mm. Instead, it's peace be unto thy soul. Thank you. A few days ago, I gave a speech at a leadership conference about leadership principles. And I, I have to say that uh, many of the principles contained in these letters have virtual application across the world if you're a leader of, of any kind. And I remember myself being deeply impressed by these sections. Uh, I first became really aware of them when I was 11 years old and I had to memorize a verse or two or three from, from I think it was section 121. Uh, and then I later, as a, I think as a young missionary or in my early 20s at some point, I, I memorized all three of the sections, 121, 122, and 23 in their entirety uh, and enjoyed just reciting them in, in my own brain. So I want to thank both of you for participating with us in this, in this conversation this evening. Uh, we're grateful for your preparations for this. I want to remind our audience again of next month's conversation, Church History and the World, Doctrine and Covenants, Section 132, featuring Kathleen Flake. Finally, we invite you as an audience to revisit tonight's conversation and previous ones by accessing the John A. Witzel Foundation website www.witzelfoundation.org. Normally it takes about a week for our foundation staff to get the conversations up online. So a check next week for, for this one. We're grateful that you could be with us this evening. Thank you for listening and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.